Today I want to talk a little bit about a bonding theory that works for kind of thinking about modeling covalent bonds. So we're talking molecular compounds, nonmetals with other nonmetals. So when we have these things bonded together, then there's various things going on at an electron level. And in order to model these things, we have to understand things about atomic orbitals, we have to understand things about electrons, and we have to understand things about the geometry of molecules. So kind of putting together all of these concepts get us into the idea of sigma and pi bonds and get us into what I'm going to introduce today as valence bond theory, which is kind of the underpinning of all of the ideas um, that go into how do molecular compounds form, how do they bond together, um, and it all comes down to an interaction between the electrons and the atomic orbitals on these atoms. So we're focusing on sigma and pi bonds. Sigma in Greek is S, and pi in Greek is P. So when we're talking about S and P, this relates back to what we talked about with atomic orbitals, um, it, because the highest energy S and P electrons on a non-metal anyway are going to be the valence electrons the outermost highest energy electrons and that gets us into valence bond theory then so valence bond theory says that a bond between non-metals so again we're just on that kind of that corner of the periodic table with non-metals and other non-metals so we have our stair step of metalloids we're just talking about these guys that are doing this. So the highest energy S and P electrons are found um, kind of in these particular orbitals, depending on where it is on the periodic table, the uh, row that it's in or the period that it's in. And so these highest energy S and P electrons are going to interact with each other and are shared between two atoms in order to form a covalent bond. Well, how does that happen? Valence bond theory tells us. It says a bond will form if there's an overlap between the atomic orbitals from two atoms that are in the bond. So the atomic orbitals, recall, are a three-dimensional mathematically derived shape, essentially, which represents both kind of the physical location of an electron as well as the energy of the electron because they can be both waves and particles. They have wave-particle duality. And so when that atomic orbital, that kind of space or that region where the electron can be overlaps with another, then the potential for a bond uh, exists. So we have to have overlap between the two atomic orbitals and the total number of electrons in the overlapping orbitals cannot be more than two. So you're really talking about either two from one and zero from another, and we could share those one and one, we could share those. But if we have two and one, then we can't have three electrons in these overlapping orbitals. So we can only have a bond that forms um, if there are no more than two total. So that's kind of the general idea of things. Let's start to get our heads around what this looks like visually. Let's take H2, which is kind of our simplest molecule. It's two hydrogen atoms that are bonded together. And when we think about hydrogen, we think, well, it has a one electron. And if we were thinking of the electron configuration, we would say that's the 1s1 electron. It's an electron in the 1s orbital. So when I pair two hydrogens together, then they can share these electrons between them. And we represent that with our Lewis structure as a hyphen kind of between the two that represents that shared pair. But what we're really showing is that there's an overlap in the s orbitals for each of my hydrogens. So an s orbital, recall, is spherical. So here's my 1s for one of my hydrogens. And if that atomic orbital from one of my hydrogens overlaps with the atomic orbital from a second hydrogen, then that overlapping region is where I'm most likely going to find this pair of electrons. And the reason for that is because these negatively charged electrons like to be between the positively charged nuclei for each of my hydrogens, right? Each of my hydrogens has one proton at its nucleus, and so these electrons like to be between those two positive charges. That's the best place for them to be from an energetic standpoint. 
so this overlapping region is a covalent bond. This is where these electrons are shared. So when we're talking about a shared pair of electrons, a covalent bond, whether it is polar or nonpolar, it is going to be between these atomic nuclei and exists in this region where the atomic orbitals are overlapping. Okay, so this is a lot of words to say all of that. You're like, well, it looks like a Venn diagram, and yes, it does. So that middle bit is your covalent bond. So let's talk about what this means in terms of sigma and pi, then. There are really two types of bonds that can form. The sigma, again, comes from the Greek S. S. And pi is P. And the only reason I mention that is because it helps to ground me in the concept to think about things in terms of S and P because those are the highest energy electrons for my nonmetals. And we're just talking about nonmetals with other nonmetals because they're the only ones that will covalently bond. So they're the only things that are going to do this. So sigma bonds are an overlap that is in line with the bond axis. So any bond is a sigma bond. So single bonds are sigma bonds. So all single bonds are sigma. So if we think about our hydrogen and those overlapping s orbitals again, my bond axis then is kind of that x axis there. And so the overlap is in the line of the axis. We could also think about something like, you know, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a nice one to think about in terms of the axis on it because it's a linear molecule. So CO2 exists in a straight line. It's got two electron groups around that central atom, which gives it linear geometry. So we have kind of a 180 degree angle between the atoms there. So if we're thinking of the axis of this bond, it's going to go straight through that line. And anything in line with that axis is going to be a sigma bond. So there's going to be one sigma bond that's in each of these guys as well. So that's an S. And this is my terrible rendition of a Greek sigma. Um, it kind of looks like a nine that is leaned over on its side um, or something. It looks kind of like an eyeball with one eyelash, something. Anyway, so pi then are overlapping orbitals that are parallel to the bond axis, meaning that they're above and below the axis or in and out of the bond axis. So that's going to come from things like p orbitals, hence the pi part. So some p orbitals might look like this, right? We have kind of these guys along the y axis. So if the bond is going across here with whatever I'm talking about, whether it's oxygens and carbons, whatever it is, my nucleus for each of my atoms is at the center. That's the axis that they're along. So I'm kind of creating a line between the nuclei of my bonds that are, or of my atoms that are in the bond. And that axis then, if I have overlapping orbitals that are above and below that axis, like this, then this would be what is called a pi bond. Now this happens when we have double and triple bonds. So pi's exist um, as double. There's one pi in that. Or triple bonds. There's two pi's in that. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on this. Keep an eye out for another video on uh, orbital hybridization. And I'll get into some more detail on kind of how that works and these overlapping p orbitals in the context of actual molecules. In this video, I'm really just focusing kind of on the concept. So all sigma bonds or all single bonds are sigma bonds. And if I have a double bond, then it's one sigma and one pi. And if I have a triple bond, it's one sigma and two pi's. And again, we'll kind of get into some details in future videos, but we're just talking kind of the model here. Now, from a what does this mean from a physical characteristic standpoint? How strong that bond is depends on how well the orbitals overlap. So if there's a really good overlap, if they overlap really well, like my two s orbitals, for example. So I have kind of two circles here that represent my s orbitals. If I have two s orbitals, and this is my bond axis kind of going across here, 
then the overlap here is quite strong, right? It's kind of two balloons that have overlapped that space there, that region there is, is quite good. That works really well with spheres because we have these overlapping regions where they can come together. This is more challenging when we get into other orientations of the orbitals, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So there's kind of a couple different features that go into how strong a bond is. It can be based on the size of the orbital, which if we think about our quantum numbers is n. Remember our principal quantum number gave us the energy or how far away or what shell the electrons are in or how far away from the nucleus the electrons are. So the size matters and the orientation of the orbital matters. And that's our L, our angular momentum quantum number, as well as our magnetic quantum number, which is the type of the orbital. So is it an S or a P? And the orientation. So once we get more than an S orbital, which we know that a sphere is just kind of a sphere no matter what, but when we get into other orbital types, those different shapes and orientations are going to give us different levels of overlap. And so let me get into that briefly without getting into any kind of actual examples yet. We'll save that for another video. Okay, so here's my S orbital. We kind of use this as a my very high-tech modeling here. <laughs> Here's our S orbital. S orbitals are spheres, recall. Um, you can see that I am not good at drawing spheres. That is a consistent theme in my videos. So here's our S orbital that is spherically shaped. And if I think about overlapping with another S orbital, like I said, that overlap is really good. It's along the bond axis. It's always going to be along the bond axis because they're both spheres. But if I wanted to overlap between an S and say a P orbital, so recall that P orbitals are kind of have these two lobes. So I have kind of a big P orbital here, but I have the three different orientations. This is kind of my PY along the Y axis, the PX along the X axis, and then this one's kind of coming in and out of the plane at you. So that would be our PZ. So I have three M sub L values for my P orbitals, so three different orientations. Now if I bring in the, each of those orientations to an S orbital to see if I can overlap, we can see that some of them are going to overlap better than others. And if we think about the Z, that would be like this one coming in and out and trying to, okay. So with the P orbitals and an S orbital, then there's only gonna be certain ways that there's a really nice overlap. And hopefully you can visually see that the PX has that best overlap there. If we're talking about the bond axis being along this line, so if this is the line of my bond axis along my, my S, then the best sigma bond I can get, the best overlap along the bond axis is gonna be with the S and the PX. And I'm not gonna get that same overlap between my PZ or my PY, because I'm just not gonna have that same region where these things are interacting with each other because it's such a small amount of these areas where the electron actually can exist because it's closer to the node. So recall that a node on an orbital like this is a region where, that's a D, sorry, node is a region where the electron is not going to be. So if I have an area where the electron isn't trying to overlap with the S orbital where the electron is, then that's not going to give me a very strong bond. So the best overlap, the best sigma overlap, is between my PX and my S when we are overlapping S and P orbitals. And again, this is just kind of an in line with the axis, here's my sigma bond, and then out of the axis gives me kind of these overlapping p orbitals outside of all of that. So this one kind of above and below, this one in and out of the plane. So these guys aren't going to interact as well with the s orbitals, although my px will, and my s orbitals will interact with other s orbitals quite well. So it's really all about how well does this region in space overlap with another? How likely am I to find electrons there? And if I have a strong overlap, that will give me a strong covalent bond. As always, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll talk to you again soon.